morning. Today is Tuesday, March the 8th, 2016. It's 10 a.m. It's my pleasure to call to order the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance Board of Funeral Directors and the Bombers. Ms. Lisa Mosby, would you please call the roll? Dennis Bridges? Here. Mark Carthen? Here. Robert Davis? Here. Jeff Duffer? Here. Robert Helms? Here. David Neal? Here. Charles Rahm? Here. Mr. President, we have all board men members accounted for. Thank you, Ms. Mosby. Moving on to the agenda, take your time, look over it. Make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Motion by Mr. Ham, second by Mr. Rom. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. On to the approval of the, um, the minutes. Motion to approve minutes as presented. Second. Motion by Mr. Rom, second by Mr. Hams. All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Now to the informal conference regarding summer suspensions. Uh, good morning, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is uh, Denard Mickens, and I uh, represent the department, the uh, Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. Uh, this um, informal conference today, uh, we are uh, presenting a matter uh, for consideration, for your consideration, uh, regarding the uh, potential summary suspension of uh, Mr. Dwight D. Creighton, uh, funeral director license number five four five three. Mr. Creighton is formerly the manager at uh, Hickory Hills Funeral Home in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, since we began uh, the investigation that led us to here this morning, uh, he has since been terminated, but he, he does still have a uh, active license. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Creighton uh, has been uh, accused of multiple violations uh, of the standards um, of funeral directing, including uh, falsifying death certificates uh, by using the name and license number of an embalmer that w had never worked for the funeral establishment uh, where he was the manager at Hickory Hills. Uh, basically, <clears throat> he was uh, submitting death certificates uh, that featured the name and embalming license number of a Miss uh, Ternisha Thompson. Uh, Miss Thompson um, filed a complaint with the board uh, when she discovered uh, she, uh, Ms. Thompson uh, is a licensed funeral director and embalmer in the state of Tennessee, uh, but she's never worked uh, in the industry. Um, she uh, was applying for a job. Uh, the person that was going to hire her <clears throat> was doing a background check um, and um, somehow discovered um, that uh, her name was being her name and license number was being used on these death certificates um, she uh, filed a complaint with us and w we looked into it um, and so we sent uh, one of our investigators uh, mr. Roy Bozeman uh, out to investigate um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm available to answer any questions once I'm all done but uh, mr. Bozeman is also available uh, by phone if you want to talk to him directly but um, <clears throat> um, Ms. Ms. Thompson uh, told us uh, in, in, our, in her complaint and in her conversations with Mr. Bozeman that uh, she's never worked in the industry um, at all. She's never signed any death certificates. Um, she did interview uh, at Hickory Hills, um, and uh, she did meet with uh, Mr. Creighton, who we're talking about today, but um, uh, she did not uh, accept or, or, according to her, was even offered a job. But during the course of that job interview, he did ask her to provide a copy of her embalmer's license and her funeral director's license, which she did. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, after speaking with Ms. Uh, Thompson, our investigators spoke with uh, multiple individuals connected to Hickory Hill. Uh, none of the individuals that uh, we contacted uh, were able to testify to ever seeing Miss Thompson at Hickory Hill. Uh, according to her, she's never even uh, stepped foot into the business itself. Um, they did have the the current uh, embalmer at Hickory Hill as a as a uh, a licensed. Uh, 
a Tennessee embalmer named um, Jessica Bodie. Uh, she uh, told our investigator that uh, she had never actually signed any of the death certificates when they when she's finished with uh, her embalming. Um, the uh, all the her information was already fil- typed in uh, by someone. She said she didn't know who did it at Hickory Hills. Um, before Miss Bodie, <clears throat> they had. Uh, Another licensed uh, embalmer named Paul Parham, uh, he does trade embalmings for uh, Hickory Hills and other funeral homes in the area. Uh, he also test, oh, not really testified. He also told our investigator uh, that when he would finish an embalming, um, the, he never signed any death certificates either. All of his information was filled in uh, prior to, to doing it. Um, <clears throat> the the office manager at Hickory Hills, uh, Miss Andrea Tucker, uh, told uh, the investigator that Mr. Creighton uh, was responsible for completing all of the death certificates at Hickory Hill. Um, again, like I said, he's no longer uh, there, but he does have a a uh, a um, active license. Um, <clears throat> uh, in addition, um, during our investigation, it appears that um, uh, Mr. Creighton um, was also possibly, uh, in addition to falsifying death certificates, um, was also um, falsif- uh, failing to pay uh, federal income taxes uh, for the, the individuals that worked at Hickory Hill. He was the manager of Hickory Hill. Um, none of the individuals that we spoke to had ever received a 1099 or a W-2, uh, even if they were full-time employees, they were paid in cash or with uh, checks. Um, and at year end, they never got any um, paperwork in order to fill out their own taxes. Um, <clears throat> uh, we did uh, give Mr. Creighton uh, the opportunity to appear as required um, under the uh, 320C notice. Um, and uh, his uh, written response has been um uh, submitted to you all. It should be on your uh, iPads. Um, basically, he said he doesn't work in the industry anymore, and, and he wasn't able to get time off to join us today. Um, he, he also does not address any of the allegations that we dis- uh, just talked about. Um, in his response uh, to our uh investigator who did talk to him directly, uh, he claims that Miss Thompson was indeed a contract embalmer with Hickory Hill, and that after she separated her employment there, he discarded her employment file because it contained um, sensitive information such as her social security number. He claims he, he didn't keep any copies at all to show that she may have actually worked there. Um, again, um, talking to Miss Thompson, she's adamant she's never worked there other than and she's never even been in the building other than um applying for a job there um and so um he uh mr creighton confirmed to our investigator he doesn't have any documents and there's no documentary evidence to show that uh ternisha thompson ever um worked there um <clears throat> And uh, and so because of the serious allegations against him, the fact that he does still have an active license, um, you know, he in, in his written response uh, to the board, um, he uh, claims that he's looking into trying to start his own funeral home uh, in the near future. Uh, we felt it was uh, uh, very important to bring this to your attention and uh, to discuss uh, suspending him uh, in preparation for a, f- a formal hearing uh, on revocation. Um, and I'm available for any questions that you may have, any follow-up questions. And also, um, Mr. Uh, Bozeman, the investigator, is available if you have any questions, if you'd like to speak to him directly. Department have any recommendations on length of suspension time? <clears throat> uh, based on the, these allegations, we would recommend that he is suspended until, um, and we would uh, try to have a, a full hearing, a formal hearing, um, as soon as we could get on the, uh, uh, you know, find get a hearing date before the board. Information that's been presented, I make a recommendation that uh, the board suspend the motion by Mr. Rom and a second by Mr. Bridges on suspending the license. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Ocean Carries. So, uh, Mr. Mickens is going to create a, an order, a formal order, um, uh, memorializing that summary suspension of the license. Um, and when we, um, he'll bring it back down for the chairman to sign the chairman's signature for that. Now to the legal report, Anthony Glendorf. Good morning. I, I'm glad I got the opportunity to introduce myself to each of you all. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give a, a summary of, of kind of what the legal report does for the new members um, on the board here. Um, and for the members that have been here before, I apologize for the redundancy. Um, but every during every meeting, um, what the attorney for the board who uh, generally does is they create a legal report, which is a summary of complaints uh, that have been uh, submitted to the department um, regarding any of your licensees or, or non-licensees who are doing unlicensed activity. And what we do is we, um, we look at those cases and complaints, and we, if necessary, sending, send our investigators out to go obtain more facts to determine whether or not a violation occurred. And when we receive those investigation reports back, we create this report for you, which we generally call the legal report, which is a summary of, of the complaint um, along with the pertinent facts involved that we found. And then legal gives a recommendation as to whether or not a violation occurred under a statute or rule. And then we recommend some civil penalty amount and type. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the attorney for this board generally reads the report, um, the facts of the case to the report to you all. We also include the history of the licensees in there, whether or not they've previously been disciplined, whether or not the board has previously um, um, recommended assessing discipline um, to that licensee so that it better helps you all determine whether or not the civil penalty that you're imposing is the right civil penalty amount based on their previous conduct, meaning whether or not they are actually in the future attempting to comply with the um, rules and regulations of, of, uh, of the profession. So I have no feelings hurt whatsoever if you all want to change a recommendation on civil penalties that's up to the board or whatnot it's kind of a sometimes it's a it's a game of the history involved in the in the uh, the type of violation that occurred and whether or not there was mitigating factors involved or whatnot so um, that's not generally an issue uh, the, the only thing that we usually stand hold stand true to is whether or not we determine that a violation occurred we like to be right on that part <laughs> Uh, especially as to the occurrence of the violation. Um, and if you all have any questions as we go, feel free to stop me or whatnot. But the, but the document that you have in front of you for the new members is, anom is anonymously provided, meaning you'll see a case number attached to it, but you will not see, you should not see any names of actual licensees so that as you go through this process, you're completely unbiased as to whether or not you uh, know of that person or the, that establishment within the industry so that you can make an unbiased decision about that. Um, and uh, do, you, do you all generally um, adopt the complaints as you go or all at the end? As we go. As you go. Okay. So that's easy enough. And if you have any questions for me at the end of this, like you said, I will do my best to answer them. We have an electronic filing system, so I actually don't have physical files to bring down here. So if I cannot answer your question, I'll tell you that I cannot, and I will get back to you today if we can. Um, and if not, and you all feel necessary, we can absolutely remove something from this report and answer y'all's questions and bring it back some other time. Kind of the parameters that I like to, to, to work under. Um, and so I'll, I'll be doing, and, and just to, I guess I introduced myself earlier today, but I did want to say that um, I appreciate uh, this board and y'all um, letting us come down and provide you all with, with the best legal service and support that we can and you don't have a permanently assigned board member to you all yet like i said ellery did leave but we are uh, vigorously interviewing for new attorneys able to fit to this board and um, provide you guys with the best legal advice we intend to fill that position just as fast as we can um, like i said we've been interviewing for this for this position and i know robert will be looking forward to getting an attorney and and uh it's going to be hard to find one as good as ellery Quite honestly, but we're going to find the, we're going to pick the best candidate that we that we get, um, and I appreciate Mr. Gribble working working with me, uh, in, you know, for the past week and into the future, you know, with um, shoring up all of these issues and dealing with. I gave you all my business card, so if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to to contact me. Okay, um, and with that.
I'll just go, I'll go ahead and and start uh, reading this and we'll go from there. Uh, the first case is case number two zero one five zero two two one five four one. Here the complainant alleges uh, that she went to a funeral home with an insurance policy for a deceased relative. The respondent uh, verified that the policy had a ten thousand had a ten thousand dollar limit and then proceeded to explain the charges. Um, for services, the complainant states that the respondent called back and stated that they would owe $4,500 because what was believed to have been a $10,000 policy only turned out to be $5,500. The complainant states that she was was only shown one package of services and would have chosen a lesser, lesser package as she knew that the insurance policy wouldn't cover all the funeral expenses. The respondent did not respond to the complaint. We conducted an investigation. The funeral director stated that at the time the family came to the funeral home, the, the life insurance policy was initially thought to be for $10,000, but was later later verified at being $5,500. And she, the funeral director stated that this was prior to actually contracting with the family members for services um, and that the family was aware uh, at the time of contracting that it was only $5,500. Statements were taken from pertinent members of the family who were who were all there on the same day. Um, who claimed slightly different stories as to when when they were informed of the policy limit only being $5,500. Uh, some family members claimed that they learned of this after contracting for the funeral services. Uh, there's an inconsistency in making, which makes it difficult to determine with a degree of certainty as to whether or not the family was informed of the policy limit and at which time. As such, there's insufficient evidence to show that the funeral home intentionally misinformed the family as to the limited insurance policy at the time of contracting and withheld this information until after the services were provided. Uh, we do provide the history of each of these uh, of, of this respondent here that you can see there. Uh, I'll let you read those for yourself um, and our recommendation. And based on uh, based on the complaint allegations as to the um, contracting the amount of life insurance policy, we could not find that there's a violation as any deception or misrepresentation based on the inability. Uh, to prove such violation. Uh, however, they did not, they failed to respond to the complaint, which is a violation of Rule 06611-5D, and we recommend authorization of a con consent order in amount of $250 or a formal hearing for that. Motion to accept council's recommendation. Second. Motion by Mr. Helms, a second by Mr. Duffer. All in favor say aye. 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 Any oppose? Motion carries. Uh, the next five complaints all relate to the same transaction or occurrence. Um, and you can see the pertinent parties above that are there. It includes a um, crematory establishment, a funeral home establishment, um, a manager of the crematory, uh, the manager who is um, also an embalmer licensee, and the funeral director for the funeral establishment. Uh, here a complainant stated that her father passed away <clears throat> and was cremated by the respondent crematory. When the complainant's uh, stepmother picked up the remains at the respondent funeral home, she noticed that she was leaving, when she was leaving, that the social security number was incorrect on the box containing the cremains. She spoke to the office assistant who provided her with the box and explained the error. The office assistant contacted the crematory, but merely crossed out the wrong social security number and wrote the correct one on, stating that the issue had been fixed. Uh, the tag in the cremains also had the wrong social security number on it, but the name on, on the tag was correct. The complainant was concerned as to whether or not the cremains were of her father. The crematory manager states that he mixed up the social security number of two deceased persons. His explanation was that this happened while he was creating uh, the ID tag, that another deceased person whose social security number appeared on the box and the tag in the cremains was in the retort, but his paperwork was also on the desk along with the paperwork of the decedent when he created the ID tag. The funeral home re respondent states that after the family expressed concern, the establishment double-checked all of their paperwork and discussed the situation with the crematory. They agreed that the social security number was a mix-up, but were confident the crematory gave the funeral home the correct cremains. The crematory manager even told the family what clothes the decedent was wearing when he cremated the decedent. The funeral director states that from now on they will double-check everything before calling the pa family to pick up the cremains. We did conduct an investigation 
An investigation showed that it was most likely that the Social Security number of the outgoing cremains were inadvertently placed on the permanent identification device and on the box of the temporary urn of the decedent. And when our investigator talked to the complainants, the complainants also stated that after the expl explanation that most, they most likely, excuse me, that they most likely believed the cremains they received were those of their father. And you can see the history um, involved with each of those licensees. And our recommendation is, is to uh, issue a letter of warning to the crematory and the funeral home regarding the display of incorrect Social Security numbers of the deceased family because it could be a potential violation of unprofessional conduct for failing to double check those items uh, in violation of 625-317-A4. Motion to accept the recommendation. Second. Motion with Mr. Rahm, a second with Mr. Cochran. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any oppose? Motion carries. Okay, for the for the next one, which is 2015-014-885, um, for the new members, this may be slightly confusing, I understand, but this is actually uh, an item where at the December at the December meeting, some members asked that this they asked that um, the respondent be contacted by Ellery, the previous board attorney, and ask some questions and to bring it back to you all. So we have to, in light of the scenario, <laughs> understand that four people that are here today don't actually have all of the backstory on this. Um, but what she had previously done is that this is a uh, this is a funeral establishment, and she previously recommended a civil penalty against the establishment, um, and it was in regards to a previous complaint. So there was a complaint on a different funeral establishment that was presented in December and because of that complaint we looked into this funeral establishment that was related to it and she recommended a civil penalty and then some of the board members wanted Ellery to go back and talk to the respondent because he did not that respondent did not answer um, the complaint to ask some questions okay so try to set it up the scenario for you all and I'll give another recap is that this complaint came from an investigation of a previous complaint the complainant transferred the deceased to the respondent, who is here, after problems with a different establishment. At the December 2015 meeting, the board requested that the respondent be asked to respond to the following allegations. Since that time, the respondent did respond with the following information regarding the allegations. The first one was that an unlicensed individual signed as the funeral director on the respondent's reassignment form. And you'll see A is the response. The respondent stated that this was assigned in error and corrected the same day with the respondent's signature. So the second question that we asked is that there were emails from the deceased file showing that respondent's owner and manager directed his unlicensed employees to meet with family and sign a statement of funeral goods and services and the insurance form. The respondent states that the arrangements were made three days earlier, but the insurance company contacted the next of kin, so the respondent employees were helping him fill out, uh, fill out information while the respondent was on the phone with the insurance company in the other room. The third question uh, was that the second statement of goods and services was not signed by the next of kin. The respondent states that this was only for the insurance company as a quote, that they wouldn't do anything without an actual signed statement. He contends that the family signed a final version. And the fourth issue was that the second statement of goods and services had items added without the next of kin's approval, meaning there was no signature on it. They were $100 for an ad that was appeared to be added for a bifold color programs and an increase of a credit card fee from $294.35 to $444.95, which is an increase of $150.60 that didn't appear to be authorized. Um, the respondent stated that they canceled the programs the same day and were given a cash refund. The respondent states that our investigator confirmed this with the complainants. Uh, next, you can see the history, that there is a cumulative history of this respondent. Uh, currently does have some of these issues are still outstanding. And because of the, the issues uh, provided above and the responses that were given, I recommend an authorization of a consent order in the amount of $1,500, $1,000 for, uh, for allowing an unlicensed person to act in the capacity as a licensed funeral director and $500 for the deceptive practice of adding unauthorized service and charges to the funeral goods and services form and also request authorization for a formal hearing. Question. Being a new member, what is the maximum amount allowed for? Yes, for the civil penalties, yes. It's a, confer, it is $1,000, yeah.
Each board is different, <laughs> and we have 28 boards here. It's a th your board is $1,000. Um, it's $1,000 per act, per violation, per day. So um, each one of these acts, so if, if a person does an unlicensed activity on two different occasions in the same day, that could be two acts, a maximum of $1,000 per act. Um, and so uh, a, one transaction or occurrence could have, we call it transaction, one scenario could cause multiple things. So it looks like here we saw specifically basically three things um, that it could, so w which would give you the authorization. You could do, mo you could do more. For this, you could do, theoretically, $3,000 would be the total max that I believe you could probably do on these, on this issue. Circumstances presented in the history of, of this particular situation um, I would like to, to recommend that the uh, penalties be increased uh, to 2500 I'll second that motion. Motion by Mr. Rom for 2500 and a second by Mr. Helms. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion will carry for 2500 Okay, the, the last one, number eight, case number 2015022-5831. Uh, this is a funeral home establishment. The complainant states that the funeral home did not work with them when they were trying to pick up the cremains. Uh, the complainant states that the secretary was rude, and when she called the owner to complain, her calls were not returned. Uh, we sent the complaint to the respondent, and the respondent failed to respond to the complaint. You can see the history there of the of the respondent, and our recommendation is a consent order in amount of two hundred fifty dollars for failing to respond to the complaint and authorizing a formal hearing. Uh, we actually cannot prove what are, whether or not those whether or not there was a actually acting rude to a customer. Motion to accept the recommendation. Motion by Mr. Duffer. Second by Mr. Rahm. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, and th that concludes the legal report presented to you all this morning. Thank you, Mr. Glendale. On to the director's report, Robert Gribble. Thank you, Mr. President. Board members, the first thing to look at is the legislative update. This is basically the same document that was presented to you last month. There's one addition that we thought you might be interested in, and it's the second item listed under other bills of interest to funeral directors and establishments. It's Senate Bill 2246, House Bill 1499, regarding anatomical gills. That's the only addition to, the, to what we added in presenting to you last month. If you have questions about any of those, I'll be glad to answer them to the best of my ability. If you want to see where the current uh, status of each bill is, then feel free to go to the website there at the very end where it says the website for legislative bill searches. But uh, those, uh, those bills, some of them are not having much traction and others are moving through the what appears to be the process of becoming enacted into legislation. Next item is the last knee report. It's a report of licenses that have been administratively approved by the executive director pursuant to the board's authority for the period of February 9, 2016 through March 7, 2016. So there are establishments and one individual. 
proposed establishment report for this meeting. There's been one establishment that's reported closing since the last meeting. That was Bird's Mortuary at 205 Monroe Street in Maynardville, Tennessee. Preliminary action report. These is a report of consent orders administratively accepted and approved by the executive director pursuant to the board authority for the period of February 1, 2016 through February 29, 2016. I have two of those. Last is a complaint report that shows as of yesterday there were a total of 33 complaints open in this board, one against an apprentice, five against funeral directors and embalmers, and 27 against establishments. I'll be glad to answer any questions. If you have no questions, and that concludes my report. Questions? I ask for an approval. Motion to accept the director's report. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Hams, a second by Mr. Rahm. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Now to the approval of the license applications. Mr. President, there are no individuals to appear before you today, and there's one establishment. The establishment is a proposed establishment for Life Celebration Center of Franklin. Mr. F Christopher Taylor is the proposed manager. It's to be located at 1881 General George Patton Drive, Suite 102 in Franklin, Tennessee. This establishment is to be owned by a limited liability company, which is Franklin Funeral Home LLC, 7427 Charlotte Pike here in Nashville. Both Mr. Bill Gregory, who is the sole member of this LLC, and Mr. Christopher Taylor are present today. Gentlemen, if you will, please come up to the table and kind of give an introductory, some introductory remarks to the board, and then the board members may have questions for you. Bill Gregory, and um, uh, thank you for allowing us to be here for this application for our license. A new funeral home over on Franklin Road. We've actually already started that process. This will be our sixth funeral home that we've built in the Middle Tennessee area uh, from scratch. And in every case, we um, always had a temporary office. Home was, um, was, was, was open. And uh, have, um, what we're getting approved today, what we're getting approved today is our um, temporary office that we're we're calling it temporary but it's actually a permanent office but it actually eventually will be closed down once we open up our, our process will probably be about 12 months so um, and this is Christopher uh, Taylor he will be the manager of the funeral home uh, there in Franklin Board members, I apologize. We didn't include photos in the information that you have. I don't know if we can readily get those. If you want them, we will see if we can go up and get them. But basically, the, this is a, uh, and Mr. Taylor or Mr. Gregory one can describe it better, but I would describe it as being in a building similar to this. Uh, it's, I guess the office is located probably on the first floor. It is, it is. And uh, in a suite on the first floor. Similar to uh, another establishment in the vicinity of this one. This is on General George Patton, which is a road that runs parallel to Franklin Road. So um, we're within a mile of where the location uh, uh, will eventually be. And it is a office building. We do have our own entrance going into the office. Um, if I have pictures on my phone, but uh, that I'll be more glad to show any of you. But um, w when you go in, we have um, um, a very nice boardroom, meeting room, arrangement room, and then we have a separate work room uh, with a kitchen, and then off of that we have uh, public restrooms. Exactly what will take place at this facility? 
Um, yeah, if, if, if we're lucky, we, we hope that we will have um, some families coming there to make arrangements. Um, we are limited as far as the fact that we do not have a facility to hold a service. Uh, in that area where Franklin Road is, we have four mega churches that are in that area that we could have services um, at that church if the family would like. Uh, we also have six other funeral homes that we own that are surrounding the Nashville area uh, that we also could have the visitation or service at. Um, realistically, we probably will have either a church service or a graveside service, or it could be a cremation service. So until you get your facility built, this is just kind of an arrangement. Um, y yes, yes, yes. And this is, we have done this uh, every year, I mean, every time we've built this. So this is the seventh one. We just finished the funeral home up in Springfield. Uh, we did the same thing there. We had a temporary office um, that we would conduct business in. Um, and then when we built the funeral home, then we applied for transferring the establishment license from the office to the traditional funeral home. All your selections will be computer generated. <laughs> the, uh, the selection room area that we have, we have in digital form and on uh, in book, book form, and some graphics on the wall as well. everything to you looked to be in order just for the application yes okay I'll make a motion to accept second motion by Mr. Cochran second by Mr. Bridges all in favor say aye aye, aye. any oppose <coughs> motion carries thank you very much business to be brought before the board. Motion for an adjournment. So moved. Second. Motion for Mr. Ham, second for Mr. Cochran. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. <laughs>